the star Leica DBX converter allows you to import data that was collected with Leica controllers. So this will work with um, SmartWorks and Captivate. And it'll allow you to import RTK data and conventional photo station data. To follow this exercise, let's open up our exercise project. Go to Open Project, 24 DBX Demo. So this project is just set up with uh, appropriate instrument settings. And now what we're going to do is run the DBX converter and convert a DBX file. So up until now, we've been running converters from the start menu, but this time I'll run the converter from the input menu and I go to star like a DBX. The converter appears. I will browse to define the input file. And so in this case, you want to go to materials inside this DBX folder and then you pick on the XCF file. Pick on Open. I also want to browse to define where I'd like to create my output file. So that's going to go here. And I'll create it in the Materials folder right next to the project I have open. Now, if you had used a, a geoid file or a grid shift file when you were collecting the data, you need to have a copy of that geoid file that was on the controller available on your desktop. And all you do is you go to Browse, and you browse to the folder where they're stored. I happen to have a large collection of geoid files in this online location, and we just keep them there for convenience. Once you've browsed to the geoid file once, then the converter will remember where it is. Do the same thing if you have a grid shift file. You can specify whether you want your units to be meters or feet. In this case, I want to make it US feet. You can specify precision. You can set how you want your angles to be listed as gones or degrees, minutes, and seconds. You've got quite a few checkboxes where you can specify data source options. For this one, for your survey class data, you can either have them written as M records or as SS records. Check this on to include traverse class data. Check this on to include sets of angles. And same thing for stakeout, for user entered points, for foresight measurements, for reference line measurements. I've just got everything checked on so that we'll see everything. Now in here, you get two different choices, and I'll experiment with the two so you can see the difference. When I ask to average shots and measurements, it will take all redundant measurements from the same setup and the same foresight, and it will average them. Include all shots, it'll give you all your individual observations. So this one will give you a longer file, this one will give you a shorter file. Let's see the difference. So I'll turn on average shots and sets, and I'll do an import. As soon as I've done the import, I can pick on the View Data File button, and we can have a look at the result in a uh, notepad editor. So if I go in here, so we can see we, we've got a description here where different sets have been averaged, and everything is broken down that way. So in this case, we've got a shorter overall data file. If I turn on Include All Sets, all shots and sets, and I'll do another import, and I'll overwrite my previous test. And we view it. Now we're going to find, as we go in here, where before we were seeing average sets, now we've actually got all the individual observations listed. So this one will give you, overall, a longer data file. But because you're able to see each of the observations, sometimes it makes it easier to spot outliers. Another choice that you've got is if you do have GPS vectors in your results, you may want to import them as vectors, which allows you to weight them, or you may want to have it just import them as coordinates, and you want to just select which coordinates you're going to hold to. 
Um, you can also tell it how to handle coordinate records. If I disable coordinate records, they will be imported, but they'll be commented out. If I enable, they'll be imported and they'll be set. Or if I hide them, then let's do an experiment later to see what that does. Okay, so let me uh, do this uh, test with disable on. I'll do an import. Overwrite it again. When I go into the data file, now what I'm looking for is how are these C records handled? So I notice that I've got a C record for point two, but it has a pound sign to comment it out. And I think we'll find that's how all the C records are handled, yes, in the whole input data set. Okay, alternatively, I'll turn on enable com coordinate records. We'll do another import, we'll overwrite, and we'll look at our data file. Now I've got that same C record, but this time it does not have a pound sign in front of it, and it's also been held as fixed. And as we go further down, we'll find that also uh, coordinates that were calculated in the field um, will also be shown as uh, C records. And you'll find that if you've got that option on, all these fixed points will start to distort your traverse. So watch out for that situation. And thirdly, hide coordinate records. I'll do an import and another overwrite. Look at our data file. And this time, I believe we're just not going to see any C records at all. So that means that we've only got the observations and we're going to have to manually input any coordinates that we want to constrain our observation to. So typically, I'm going to use that configuration. Um, and depending on what part of the world we're in, we may like our coordinates to be listed as northing easting or eastern northing. I'll put on northing easting. A um, couple other options here to let you handle how your stations are going to be named. Um, sometimes with uh, Trimble software, it will give station names, especially to GPS measurements, as um, having um, a dash in them and that can wreak a little bit of havoc with Starnet because Starnet um, by default will expect that dashes are separators between stations with measurements the, the, the from to. And so what you can do is you can when you're doing the import if, uh, if the converter finds station names that have dashes in them it can substitute in a different character. So in this case it'll just uh, substitute an underline. An alternative way of handling that problem is still tell Starnet to stop using the dash as the station separator in its data, but pick some other character. But I generally find using this method is the most efficient. Okay, so that's all I've got to say about uh, the different options. Let's do one more import and we'll turn it into a network. Do a little overwrite say yes to that. I have a quick look at my data file just to make sure everything looks good. There's my C records commented out. I am happy with that. The separator is still designated as a dash. That's fine. And so what that really means is if we go in here, the dash here signifies that in this case, this is a distance measurement with a vertical component between station three, the from station, and station two. And the dash just means from and to. Okay, we are now done with the DBX converter, so I will close it. But remember that you have to note where the file you've just created is located, because you have to remember that next. Okay, so now the last step is I'll pick on Add File, and I'm going to browse into that Materials folder on my desktop. And here is the file we've just created, which I will open. Now there's my data, it's being displayed, and at this point, if I run it, I'm not going to have enough information to minimally constrain my adjustment. There we can see the error message over there on the right-hand side panel. So it's warning me that I don't have any fixed X, Y, or Z stations, and I can address that by taking this coordinate that's been imported from the controller and just uncomment it. And you notice how it's automatically held as fixed. 
The other problem that we learned about in the Star of Field Genius exercise is that I don't have a direction to constrain my adjustment. So the fact is you can constrain your adjustment either by two points with either fixity or you can also use standard deviations to fix them. So you can have two points or you can have one point and one direction. And so in this case I've got a direction so I'll just take the comment away from that bearing record and although this one's held as fixed I don't even need to hold it as fixed. It'll just be uh, weighted by the normal um, instrument settings if I take away the fix, fixity symbol. Okay, and at this point I believe we can run it and we're not going to see any error messages and instead we're going to see a network. First thing I'll do is check in the chi-square test to see if uh, we're free of blunders and uh, to see if there's outliers and I do find that we have some weakness in the zeniths so I might have to go and look for, for uh, some problems there. Something else that is interesting in this little data set is that if you zoom in on the starting and finishing point, you'll find that even though this looks like a closed traverse, it doesn't quite close because we've got this shot back in from 100 that uh, isn't included. So there's a handy new, or there's a handy feature called adjust with cluster detection that is kind of a two-stage process. So let me run that special run mode. And so what this does is it does the adjustment and then it spots locations where you've got little point clusters and it's saying it's uh, suggesting that 2 and 101, which are very close to each other, may actually be intended to be the same point. And you can even tell by the uh, description that uh, it may very well be. And it's also saying that 100 and 5001 should be the same point. And that makes sense because our shot on 100 has the description, check 5001. So if you'd like both of those to be treated as the same point, then all you do is you go save and continue. It reruns the adjustment, but this time only one point is uh, included. So that's a good little trick to have if when you're in the field you uh, had some trouble over overwriting a point or uh, using a redundant point number. Well, thanks a lot for the for following through with this exercise.